Lord Jesus as well. And he's coming. What an appropriate song this morning. Thank you so much. Praise the name of the Lord. What a God. What a God. What a God. Hallelujah. How many of you know Jesus is coming? How many of you know he's coming very soon? Let me bring you up to date on a couple of things and then I will say to you, please, if you can, you need to be with us on Mondays and Thursdays in these next days that we have in front of us. Um, most of you who are trying to keep up with things know already that Israel has gone into Rafa. And uh, you have to understand that they had brought down Goliath, but going into Rafa, they must cut the head off. And that's a picture of what we are really talking about so that it cannot raise its head again. It's very serious times that we're living in, and, and uh, I, I want you to understand, if ever I could say anything to anybody about uh, paying attention and uh, looking at and, and uh, reading signs and and understanding the times and the seasons that it's, we're in, it is now. There's never been a time like now. There have never been, for those of you who've been with me on Mondays and Thursdays, that I've pulled out the, the little whiteboard and tried to draw some f time frames for you and tried to show you some things of what I personally believe. There's not one single thing that's changed my mind about what I've shared with you and what I have shown to you. Matter of fact, everything that I see and everything I know has done nothing but solidified it even more. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry. Uh, you can watch it online or whatever. Uh, I feel like my part is to try to tell you and prepare you as for the coming of the Lord. That's what the Lord is as part of my destiny, part of my calling to prepare the church for the return of the Lord. Amen. And so I try to do, and not that I am always totally 100% accurate, I'm not, but uh, at this point in time, I do not see anything that has changed the diagrams and the things that I have shown you. Does that mean that they cannot change? Of course not. But it at least keeps you on your P's and Q's to be paying attention and to be making yourself ready for the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can assure you beyond all assurance that it is not by any means years off. And uh, it, 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 it may not even be months off. Uh, you just need to be tuned not only to uh, what you personally think, but you need to compare it with the word of the Lord and the happenings that are going so fast. Time is sped up to such a, a dimension. It's very hard for us to keep up with it. And again, I would rather tell you, have you looking, have you at least halfway paying attention uh, to the coming of the Lord than my not sharing anything or my trying to give you information that looks like we are way off from it. Uh, I will never be accused of that. And uh, I hope again that something that's shared or said to you has you looking more and preparing yourself more. Now, uh, I was asking the Lord this morning about some things that we could share, and he said, you need to wait and share it this coming week. I can tell you that the days in front of us, particularly pertaining to the month of May, may be such as uh, we in America have never experienced before. So I will try to share more, uh, not today, but more as, as time goes on. And we give God all the glory and all of the praise. Amen? Amen? And so, hallelujah, praise God. And we thank the praise team this morning for the beautiful songs and worship that they let us in. Now, today, I want to talk to you about the eternal Passover. Now, most of the time, we don't, we have a tendency, and I think it's sad on our part, we have a tendency to overlook Jewish holidays. And this church has not ignored them by any means. But if ever you've paid attention, you should be paying attention now. 
And as we gather here this morning to worship the Lord and listen to the word of the Lord today, Jewish people around the world are engaged in their final preparation to celebrate the Feast of Passover, which is the first of the seven feasts, and it begins actually at sunset tonight. Now, le let me say this to you. It is the most important of all feasts. And uh, you and I have a tendency to take our, uh, should I say, uh, Resurrection Sunday or what the world is calling Easter Sunday, and we slap it down and try to make it intermingle with Passover and try to make it one and the same. Ever so often, once every blue moon, they will cross on the same date. But uh, the, the main, from God's point of view, and the, and the feast that God pays attention starts tonight and is tomorrow. There are even, uh, uh, well, anyway, let me say that. It is, though, the greatest of all feasts. Now, for the Jew, Passover is the key to their identity, and I want to show you how we fit into this puzzle. Uh, it's the key to their identity and the abiding hope of absolute total freedom in the messianic age to come it is highly significant and what it has to say in this day and time that you and I find ourselves living in and what has been happening in Israel and what's happening around the world there has not been anything quite as significant as this and this particular Passover in years and years and years over the centuries and through very observances, of course, and traditions, uh, the children of Israel are constantly reminded yearly of not only the goodness and grace of God toward his own, but also the judgment and of God upon unrighteous and those who are unbelieving. Isn't it sad? Well, let me, let me say this. It's the most gracious thing that God said in his word that the families should be sharing with the families. Don't ever, he, he says, forever and ever and ever tell them what happened. Tell them what happened, such as with the Exodus. That's what we're actually celebrating. Tell them what happened. Tell them where we came. Tell them how we were brought out uh, of uh, Egypt. Tell them. And so for now, uh, thousands of years, the Jews have been celebrating their exodus. And yet, isn't it sad that Christians who are, when we come around to Resurrection Day, when we come to that which is our exodus in one sense of the word, I'll take it further in a moment, but it is our freedom, it is our deliverance uh, of what God has done for you and I as Christians. He's broken chains over our lives. He set us free. And that day, you know, uh, honors what God did for us as he came out of the grave and gave us life on that day that we go around talking about bunnies and eggs. It is beyond me that the church has also succumbed to that and that uh, we, we get caught up in it. Why? Because we do not want to stand out and yet we should stand out. You say we don't want to stand out because the Jews have stood out all of these years. And let me remind you also that the Jews, they are less than 1% of the population in the world. And yet they have absolutely been uh, tried to be destroyed and wiped off the face of the earth from day one almost. And wouldn't that be why? Why would it be? Because it is a war between good and evil. It is a war between who is God. It is God Almighty. We know who God is, but Satan has not given up yet. And Satan is trying to say who he is, so he takes everything that would honor who God is, and he, he, he messes it all up. 
so that something that at least as we come today and as Israel is getting ready to prepare again for this feast, is it, it just is beyond me that they could hold on to something and remember how God freed them and what God did for them. And they still are celebrating, you know, after all of these thousands of years, it is a tradition that's been passed down. Even though the Jewish nation per se is so secular, the secular people still involve, you know, participate in it and, and uh, because they have not forgotten what happened. What has happened to the church? What has happened to us? I mean, Resurrection Day, oh yeah, people go to church on Resurrection Day and we wear our little fine looking clothes and we do this and we do that and do the other and then we go join in and all the world's festivities. Somewhere, somewhere we have to understand what really happened on Resurrection Day. The freedom it brought to us, what it cost God Almighty for Jesus to come and to pay a price so you and I could be free. The church, you should never forget it. You should tell everybody you know. You should explain to your children and your children's children, as was told in, in the Old Testament, as he told the, the, old, uh, the uh, old Testament folks and, and the Jewish folks, when he told them, tell you, your children and your children's and your children's and your children. Tell them what happened. Tell them what it meant. Tell them what God has done for us. Now, I, I, I just, I'm, we're so close to the coming of the Lord. You and I should be tuned to how the devil will take anything that points to God Almighty and try to tear it down. You can take Sundays. They used to be on Sundays. Sundays used to be on when I was growing up. So many hundreds of years ago now, it seems like. When I was growing up, I mean, uh, stores were closed on Sunday. Certain things were closed on Sunday. Things were honored on Sunday. It, we didn't go shopping on Sunday. It was a family joyous day during that, that day. Now there is absolutely zero difference uh, when it comes to Sunday than any other day. You cannot tell me that it is not the church's fault that the church has not stood, the church has not honored, and on top of that, the church has not cared. The church wants to participate in the world. Now, we all are there. We don't want to participate in the downfall of the world, but we want to bring the world into the church, and we don't want to stand out. We don't want to stand out. Out. We don't, we've been over. We don't want to be, you know, stick in the mud. Now, again, the doors are locked. It's a good thing because I'm sure part of you may want to leave and never come back. But it doesn't take away the truth. You know, truth will set you free. It will set you free. What has happened to the church? And when I began to, to study about the eternal Passover and put it in context of what God has done for us and look at how uh, what happened through the years and honoring what God has done. Now, you and I both know, if we're honest, we, we do not under any, oh, don't, don't misunderstand me. Oh, I've gone shopping on Sunday. I've done all these things, you know. Well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to hold myself up. I'm not, I mean, it's the thing to do. I've got a free day. Hallelujah. Let me run over there. they got good sales. <laughs> I'm just trying to say, what, what a different world we live in. And with the coming of the Lord, you have to recognize it's going to be more and more different, and there's very little time to force it all in. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm thankful that I didn't live during the Old Testament times. Don't, don't misunderstand me and the judgments that we read about in the Old Testament. And I think most of us would say, thank God we're alive today, hallelujah. And in the New Testament, the Greek word, that is translated as judgment is the source of our English word for crises. And that's exactly what happened at that first Passover described in the 11th chapter of Exodus. A crisis for the children of Israel and a crisis for Pharaoh and a crisis for all of Egypt. I mean, it was there. And so you take the Passover, it really was the festival of freedom and and human dignity from oppression 
that really is what happened. But is that not what the resurrection did for us? It freed us. If we believe, it's a believing. If you believe, if you believe, everything's taken by faith. So, you know, it was a moment of decision that would forever be remembered what happened so many years ago. 400 years they were, a little more, in Egypt, and now they're moving out of slavery into freedom. Let me also remind you all of them did not come. Let me remind you that the greatest percentage stayed I know there's been debate and this, that, and the other, but uh, nevertheless, from everything I have checked and had people check and double check and triple check, it was only about 20%, the same percent that came out of Babylon that, that, that left and uh, came out of Egypt. And it probably might be only a 20% that even go up on the rapture. Who knows? All I know is I just want to be a part of it. Hallelujah. So, I mean, I don't know everything. Sometimes I think I don't know anything. So in the Passover, we see the drama not only of freedom, but le let, me, let me back you up. Why did they not leave Babylon? It's the same thing as Israel. You've become accustomed. You become used to it. You find yourself there. It becomes more at home to you than anything else does. I mean, matter of fact, in Babylon, they weren't there for 70 years, but in Babylon, what happened? They all plugged into their surroundings. And in, in Babylon, they liked the prosperity of Babylon. They were not really terribly bad with them all the time. They plugged into, you know, uh, the society of Babylon. They liked, uh, you know, what was going on there. And it was, a, it was a developed country. And so, I mean, who in the world wants to leave Babylon and all the, the fineries at that, during that time and charge off to Jerusalem over there that was totally destroyed across miles and miles and miles, go back to everything that's torn down, have to rebuild, have to restart, and on top of that, fight the enemies around. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. To some extent, that's why so many people, see, you, you, can, you can be, it's like, you know, boiling a frog. If you do it slowly and slowly and slowly, after a while, you can just boil them alive and kill them. Not if you put it on there hot to start off with. You've got to gradually move into it. And so even in Egypt, I mean, Egypt, I mean, you know, you get where you can, hey, I, I know what I'm doing. My, see, we like to be, I use the good old southern expression, sot in our ways. We like to know, you know, okay, I get up here. I do this, at this time I do this, and I do that. And so I'm programmed. What happens to us? We become programmed. And when you get programmed, most people don't like to get out of their program. They don't want, we don't like change. And m leaving Egypt was a change. And I want to tell you something else. Leaving this world and accepting Jesus Christ is a change in your life. You can't go back and do the same things you used to do. I mean, you can't just say, hallelujah, Jesus came to my heart, glory to God, and go back down and jump into bed with everybody else you've been jumping in and do everything else you've been doing. Meeting Jesus changes your life. And change is something that we have a very difficult time with. And so we see drama on Passover, not only of freedom and redemption for the children of Israel, but the drama of the greatest judgments that you ever will see in the Old Testament was seen. And I want you to remember that on, on October the 7th, there were 1,200 Israelis that were killed, no matter what the propaganda says. 1,200 were killed. 250-something were kidnapped on that day. And, uh, you know, most people see what happened on April the 14th. Most people see it is a pre-Passover miracle that is really very close to what happened in biblical times, what just took place. And if you don't know what just took place, then you're not keeping up. And I've told you, you better keep up and see what God did a miraculous thing for them just days ago. Let's look at Exodus 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, 
I will strike Pharaoh. Remember now what we're talking about. We're talking about the Israelites who have been under bondage. They didn't start out. They didn't start out under bondage in Egypt when they first went. Remember, it was a haven for them. Goshen was there. Joseph was in charge. They were a blessed people. They were honored. They were esteemed. And then there came people who didn't know Joseph and who had not followed. Somebody didn't pass on, did they? Somebody didn't pass on what had happened. Somebody they got that says that there were there was the kings and pharaohs who didn't even know who Joseph was. How in the world could that have happened? And so we're talking about they'd been in slavery, horrible slavery, and then they'd been crying out to God. God heard them, and this is where we are. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will strike Pharaoh and the land of Egypt with one more blow. After that, Pharaoh will let you leave this country. In fact, he will be so eager to get rid of you that he will force you all to leave. Tell all the Israelite men and women to ask their Egyptian neighbors for articles of silver and gold. Now, the Lord has caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the people on Israel. And Moses was considered a very great man in the land of Egypt, respected by Pharaoh's officials and the Egyptian people alike. Moses had announced to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, at midnight tonight, I will pass through the heart of Egypt. All the firstborn sons will die in every family in Egypt, from the oldest son of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, to the oldest son of his lowliest servant girl, who grinds the flour. Even the firstborn of all the livestock will die. Then a loud wail will rise throughout the land of Egypt, a wail like no one has ever heard before or will ever hear again. But among the Israelites, it will be as peaceful that not even a dog will bark. Then you will know that the Lord makes the distinction between the Egyptians and the Israel. Lights. Wow. <laughs> Think about that, church. Can you imagine the trauma uh, that was happening in that entire nation when it was discovered that every home in Egypt, from Pharaoh's palace to the poor shack, every firstborn son was found dead? Not only in Exodus 11, but throughout the Bible, there is a recurring theme that says over and over, God's judgment is always accomplished with mercy and with grace. Always. And you need to remember that in the days ahead. What makes you think America is not under judgment or about not to be under judgment? It already is. There's some things that are, there is no way with the stance that we have taken there is no way, if Egypt was just, there is no way in other places that America can be just, you know, God will just turn his head. It's what we have done to the nation of Israel and what we've done in this nation with absolutely thousands upon thousands, almost as many uh, babies have been killed as the whole city of Augusta, Georgia. So, from the moment when he, I mean, the population of Augusta, from the moment when he clothed his first rebellious children, Adam and Eve, who were his rebellious children, right up to the mercy and grace in our own lives, we can echo the words of Solomon found in Lamentations. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Let's say it together. Great is his faithfulness. Now, at the time of that first Passover, there was a wrestling match going on between the head of the state of Egypt, of course, which was the Pharaoh, and God's leading man of the hour, which was Moses. Moses didn't even start out until he was 80 to begin that journey of freeing them. Now, in the midst of their conflict, 
10 plagues occurred, if you remember, with increasing severity, and the last one was the most severe. The plagues had been gradually intensified from the turning of the Nile River now into blood. Now, let me remind you, things have happened across the nation, and they're gradually intensifying. If you are asleep, you're missing it, but you need to be paying attention. The plagues have been gradually intensified from the turning of the Nile River into blood to the gnats, the lice, the frogs, and to the, you know, the plague against the animals, to the flies and the boils and the hail and the locusts and the darkness, and then we come down to the firstborn. Wow. So Moses came, all of a sudden he w we went through all of these plagues and then he shows up and he says, he announced each one of them, gave Pharaoh every one of them a chance to change. And he came up with the last one, which again was the most severe. And he said, the 10th plague, people and livestock will be killed. I promise you that most people did not believe him. I guarantee you they did not. He was a voice crying in the wilderness. Hardly anybody wanted to follow him. They tried to, even, even his own people said he was sent by God. They didn't believe the thing he said. For the longest time, they tried to kill him, told him to go back. They didn't even want to listen to him. Read the story. Read the story. So given the stunning enormity of their deliverance, it's no wonder that the Jewish people have celebrated their miraculous deliverance every year over the centuries. Now, do we, do we constantly praise God for our deliverance? See, the Passover is kind of like a praising God for their deliverance. Do you praise God that he's delivered you? Just ask him. Just ask him. So as they sit at their tables this evening, the youngest in the family will ask the traditional question, why are we doing this, and what does this mean? And as the highlight of the evening, the head of the household will respond by retelling the story of Exodus. And every part of the set of meal, set of meal, every part of it tells part of the story. The Jewish people will celebrate, even they did celebrate, even in wartime, the magnificent, they are in wartime right now, and they are celebrating the magnificent liberation experienced in Egypt, the amazing redemption, you know, uh, from their lives as slaves. Thank God I've been delivered. I'm not a slave to sin anymore. Amen. They will carefully follow the prescriptions that were given in the Torah for the observance of Passover to honor once again what the Lord God of Israel did for his people. I praise God for what he did in my life. How many of you praise God? I, have you so far removed yourself from, from and walked in your victory so long that you forgot where you were? That's the trap of the devil. Praise should always be upon our lips. You may ask, why is that, what does all this have to do with us? We're not Jewish. It's important because it's a major declaration of the biblical history of redemption, which Paul talked about in Romans chapter 1. For I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It's the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it's through faith that a righteous person has life. Praise God. So the very moment that you and I submitted our life to the Lord Jesus Christ, we passed over <laughs> from death to life, from condemnation to elevation, the very minute, and from being a slave of sin to being a love slave of the Lord God Almighty. Praise the name of the Lord. I, we were changed, we were rearranged, we were transformed, all because the perfect Lamb of God bled and died on Calvary so that you and I could be free from every form of slavery, 
every form of sickness and death. Glory to his glorious name. Can I have a hallelujah in the house? The feast of Passover isn't just about the Jewish people. It's about you. It's about me. It's about the outstanding salvation and redemption that we received in all honesty by Jesus and what we received through Jesus. His blood, praise God, has been applied to the doorpost of our inner being. And therefore, the angel of death passes over us when the enemy would like to take us out. Glory to God. Exodus 12. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you're staying. When I see the blood, he says, the Lord God is talking, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. So on the doorposts of every, Hebrew, of every home, the Hebrew home, the children of Israel were commanded to do certain things. And that's going Exodus 12:21. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel together and said to them, Go pick out a lamb or young goat for each of your families. Slaughter the Passover animal. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, what I'm going to read it to you. I should have given it to you in New American. It says this. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families. Slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood which is in the basin, apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and two doorposts, and none of you shall go outside the house, the door of the house, until morning. So three things, they, they were to slay the Passover lamb, apply the blood, and don't leave your house till morning. Three things they were told to do. So each family was to produce a lamb and to keep it in their home for four days before slaying it. Why four days? Because four is the number of commitment. Now, listen so you get this. Why were they told to do that? Because it was a test of faith. Along with many other gods, the Egyptians worshipped lambs. So taking a lamb the Egyptians' deity, into your home for four days with the intention of slaughtering it and then eating it. Put the children of Israel in great danger. It was an act that was sure to be noticed by the Egyptians and would have infuriated them, as you can imagine, because they saw a great disrespect toward, quote, their God. Keeping a lamb for one day would be something else. But keeping it for four days was a major challenge. So the courage to follow the commandments of the Lord and to do what he said in possible danger being around them was a serious testimony of their commitment to obey the Lord. See, most of us will obey part of it. We just don't want to get carried away and obey all of it, you know. The lamb, as you remember, had to be without blemish. Though the religious leaders of Jesus' time, they refused to recognize him for who he was. But John the Baptist, the last of the Old Testament prophets, understood immediately. You say, well, John the Baptist didn't live in the Old Testament, but he was an Old Testament prophet. You don't become a New Testament person until the, Jesus is, is, is died and is raised from the dead. And you accept him as your Lord and Savior after that happens. So... The promise of the Old Testament had arrived. The perfect Lamb of God. Hallelujah. He had come. Now, church, the concept of Jesus as the Lamb of God is not a New Testament invention. He was foreshadowed on that first Passover night when the Hebrews sacrificed a lamb, spread the blood on the doorpost, and then consumed the lamb at the Passover table. That first Passover was God's declaration to the world that death was not the end of the story after Adam and Eve. Praise God. That earthly rulers 
would never succeed in keeping his people captive and that a day was coming when all mankind, Jew and Gentile alike, would be set free to become what God intended from before creation. Now listen closely. I want you to hear what God intended. In the Passover, God was saying, man was not created for death, but for life. Yet sin has kidnapped him into a hellish future of his own making. Therefore, God says, I will intervene, for I am not willing to be deprived of the family I, you know, dream of having, the delight I look forward to of a heaven filled with my sons and my daughters. What a God we serve. So in full agreement with everything the Father said, Jesus said, I'll go. I'll do it. I'll follow your plan so you can have your family because without Jesus, there would not be a family in heaven. Without Jesus, you and I would not be a family of God. Think of all the people you know that are not a part of the family of God because they chose not to believe. And most of them choose not to believe because it's a faith act and because it requires change. Change is a huge issue in most people's life. So I don't know about you, but I'm extremely thankful. <laughs> so we may not follow all the traditions and all the practices of the Passover like the Jewish people do. But church, we should honor the Passover because like the other feast of the Lord, all of them talk about Jesus. Every feast is representing Jesus. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, some people try to act like Paul disdained the festivals of the Lord, but he did not. That's not true. Paul understood the significance and celebrated them not as traditions, but as fulfillments of the Old Testament prophecies. Paul knew Old Testament prophecies, and he knew what they were fulfilling. As he came to the Lord, after he knew the Lord, he understood it. Now, it's important to see the drama of the Old Testament because the drama of the Old Testament, you know, reminds us that our God is not just a God of love. He's a God of justice. Amen. America has forgotten this. He's a God of justice. He's not just a compassionate father, but also a God of righteousness. We need both the Old Testament and we need the New Testament in order to follow the Lord with a balanced and comprehensive understanding of God and His ways. Those who teach that the Old Testament is no longer important, we should be praying for them because that's blasphemous. The Lord says that God never changes. Now, there isn't an Old Testament God who then changes completely into a different person in the New Testament. That is not the way it goes. God's patient with Pharaoh had an expiration date, and we need to listen. Mercy was extended as Pharaoh was given nine opportunities to repent. When he didn't, the tenth plague was the final blow. If we happen to be along God's timetable, where it appears to me and with a lot of other people that we are so much further along than most people think, if that's where we are, 
we should be seeking God, we should be praying, we should be crying out for our nation because America is in serious trouble. And the persecution, what has happened, one of the greatest last signs, the persecution, the anti-Semitism that has risen up in this nation after what happened with the slaughter by Hamas, burning babies, cooking them in ovens, absolutely ripping people apart, cutting them in pieces, and all the things that are beyond anything you and I have ever seen in any war at any time under any place happen on October the 7th. It's so horrendous they will not even report everything that happened that day. That's why so many of those that arrive to come and help and do anything are absolutely seeking as much counseling as they can possibly get. Nothing ever has happened what, like what happened on that day, what Hamas did and went back and celebrated. They just recently celebrated again. And to know that people in this nation are absolutely backing Hamas is beyond anything I could possibly comprehend. It shows to the degree of what Satan has done and how he has blocked truth. And it also shows the ignorance and the, and the leadership of demonic forces that has invaded people in high places and has blinded. We said deception in the last days was upon the earth. You have never seen such deception as what is now happening. It is unbelievable. You see all these marches, all these things for the Palestinians. And Palestine didn't even exist so many years ago. It is ridiculous. It's a result of the Philistines. We can go back and just talk forever and give you a history lesson about where they even came from. They've not been around forever. It's just ridiculous. And that they are, we, we as a nation are supporting Hamas and all these college students and all these other people who are marching and standing with Hamas and our government who is supporting and sending such things in. It is unbelievable. It has to be the highest degree of deception. Of course, in the end days, that's what the Bible says will happen. Now, we're talking about less than 1% of population in the world, the Jewish people. And what they are going through again and what is happening and what we are doing, it means that the truth has a hard time coming to the surface. And also, as we told you on last Thursday night, of all the radio stations that have been bought up, of all the propaganda where they're removing Christianity, 403, and then all the, uh, uh, the, the things that have happened with the... Uh, a Latino uh, media broadcast, all of them that have been bought up, and all of that we shared with you that now only progressive and liberal and the, uh, uh, yeah, is liberal, isn't that the word? Liberal? Yeah. Heck, can only think 403 is a lot of stations in the United States. And they are lies, lies, lies. And I guarantee you, if you were to be a part of one of the marches, that's happening across the nation, and there's been there's been uh, uh, here in Augusta, Georgia, there's been uh, they've taken out uh, 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 what is the word that you take out so that you can have a march, taken out uh, permits so that marches could take place here in Augusta. On about I know about four of them already that have have been done through the last m couple of months or so, and. And you hear me, you could be in the middle of them. They have no idea what they're marching for. They don't care. They just want to be a part of. They want to be accepted, and they want to make noise. It is a sad day what is happening. And I, if the church does not wake up, it is incomprehensible to me 
that these things can be going on and the church is not even repulsed by it. And the church doesn't even want to come to pray and pray and pray. The greatest force known to mankind is prayer. The greatest thing the church has is to push it back and push it back and push it back and call on God's hand to intervene, to intervene. But you also have to interpret in the times in which where the Bible says in the end days what you and I are watching was going to happen. And it's, it's, it's just astounding to me. I have to just sit back and take a breath. I can hardly, you know, it's just, I, it's hard to see that this has happened. See, I would think above any time in the world that churches would be filled. I would think they'd start coming from every angle. I would think, you know, we must realize what's going on. But I promise you, you could take a census in the middle of the marches, in the middle of everything that's going on, you'd find tons of them who'd say they were Christian. You heard me, I said, say they were Christians. There is a change that must take place in one's life when you are born again and that's just the truth so anyway he's a god as i say god of love yes but he's a god of justice he's not just a compassionate father he's a god of righteousness as i said now god's patience as i said a few minutes ago with pharaoh had an expiration date everything has an expiration date everything has an expiration date Mercy was extended as Pharaoh was given nine opportunities. Repeat myself, I know, was given nine opportunities to repent. When he didn't, the tenth plague was the final blow. Now, God delivered Israel by his own hand, and Pharaoh's army was destroyed. God was not unjust when he drowned the Pharaoh's army. What does the word say? It says in Romans, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. The Passover was a one-time event, church. Never again did God repeat it. It's been commemorated year after year after year, but the actual event has never been repeated. Calvary was a one-time event, never to be repeated. It's been commemorated for more than 2,000 years, but Jesus will never again die. Romans 6.10. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of Almighty God. Every year, church, we pay attention to Good Friday. We celebrate Resurrection Sunday, lest we forget the great price that was paid for mine and your redemption. Passover is the first of the yearly festivals of Israel, and it's important. But it was not just important to the Jews. It was very important to Jesus. Now, how do we know that? Because one of the few times that the New Testament speaks of the deep longings of Jesus to celebrate the feast was in the very last days of his life. And as he sat at the table with his disciples, what we call the Last Supper, Jesus suddenly changed the wording of what had been spoken at Passover celebrations and gatherings for centuries and cast a whole new meaning on that celebration. Luke 22. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And a few moments later, he went on in Luke 19. He took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance and to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. 
Now, with these words, Jesus introduced the eternal Passover. And it's available to everyone who will receive him as Lord and Savior. You will forever, death will never touch you, ever. So before we close, let me point out just a few other things. Notice that at Passover, God requires that only bread without yeast may be eaten. Now, why was that? Because yeast is symbolic of sin. Throughout the scriptures, that's true. You remember how Jesus warned the people against the leaven of the Pharisees. Eating only unleavened bread was to be seen as a symbol of the rejection of sin and the embracing of a pure life. He also commanded that bitter herbs dipped in sweet wine could be part of the Passover meal, signifying that through God's redemption is sweet, it comes to us by the bitter crucifixion of his son. Finally, the children of Israel were commanded to leave Egypt in haste. Yet another prophetic sign that when our moment of leaving the Egypt of this world arrives, we too will depart in haste in the twinkling of eye to celebrate the greatest feast of all, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, I haven't by any means covered all the spiritual meanings of the Passover, but I pray that you have seen the profound significance of this feast of the Lord designed by God to speak to his people throughout all ages. May we be a people who have passed over into a life of sanctification, living, we have been changed, we are living a new life, leaving behind the pleasures of Egypt, if you call them pleasures, as we choose instead to celebrate the great table of the Lord. And we can say, come, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, come. Maranatha, Maranatha, Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus, and take us home to that great supper that you have prepared for us. That's next on the agenda. And we thank you and praise you for it, Lord God. Now, as we come today to celebrate the meal that Jesus celebrated that night, and we come to talk about what he did for us as we've already described it. I think there's a few things that we forget sometimes when we do something over and over. You, we just need to stop and think about it. You know, we have a tendency to just do things and it becomes routine. And when it becomes routine, it loses its meaning for us. And I think one of the things that I would ask you to really think about today We've talked about it a lot, but I think that we just need to really look at it and think about it again. The Bible says over in Corinthians that when you come to the table, what the Lord has prepared, and he did it, and we, do, we come here to remember what Jesus did for us so that what his sacrifice meant, his resurrection meant, how he has cleansed us so that we can go into heaven clean. You can't go into heaven dirty. You have to go cleansed on the inside. I'm not talking about our physical bodies because we're going to be changed. So I'm not talking about whether you took a bath or didn't take a bath. We're not talking about that. We're talking about whether you are born again. And in order to enter heaven, you have to be born again in order to get there. And you can only get there by accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's a faith act. You have to believe and receive what God prepared for you. It wasn't much different in one sense of the word. All those Egyptians who stayed behind, 
I mean, excuse me, all those Israelites who stayed in Egypt and they just stayed because they were accustomed and didn't want to go out into the desert and God only knows where they were going and go here and go there and give up. Even though slavery, they were in slavery, it to them would be a luxury compared to the wilderness. And they didn't want to let go of what they had become accustomed to. It was a faith act. They had to believe that God sent Moses and Aaron as his spokesman. Because Moses said, I can't talk. He said, okay, I'll send your brother, and, you know, and he'll speak for you. And because God makes provisions for us to carry out what he has. They had to move in faith. I guess we could learn something about how a lot of people refuse to take a, st a faith step. If we can't see it, we can't touch it, we can't feel it, we don't have a letter from God addressed to us signed by God, which, of course, his Bible is that. But if we don't have something our own or haven't experienced something, we're not going to buy it. We're just not going to go with it. We're just not going to deal with it. And yet, that's the only way to go to heaven is to believe that Jesus came as a son of the living God sent by God here to take our place, to take my sin, take what I've done, take the horrors of my previous life, which were an insult to God Almighty, which was absolutely an abomination to God, showing nothing about God, a smear in the face of God. Oh, that's not just me. Everybody in here, I'm talking to all of us. That's what we did. We rejected God. We thought we didn't need God. We lived the way we wanted to live. Got in trouble. We asked God to tune in. But outside of that, we did. But with Jesus, when you accept him as Lord and Savior and you invite him in your life, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died for me. I believe you went to the cross for me. I believe you shed your blood for me. And I believe it washed me clean. And I believe by believing in you, I have the power to no longer be who I used to be. I have been changed, rearranged, transformed. I am not that person. So I refuse to ever talk about myself as according to who I used to be. I, I, you know, somebody else may call you anything, may point out anything, but they're just, they don't know. I am clean. I belong to God. I've been saved, redeemed. That's not who I used to be. I belong to Jesus. It's a faith act. I trust God in my life. And so as we come here, you know, I, I, I want to go to heaven, but I want to live an abundant life down here. I want to know that what comes my way, I can be victorious. I can climb it. I can overcome it. God's going to say, everything's going to be all right. God's going to get me through it some way. Somehow, God's going to show out for me. It may not look like it now. It may not look like it's going to happen. But you just keep looking. God's going to show out. We're going to see God's hand. And we're going to see him moving in it. So when we come to the table, the Lord says, I know how y'all are. I know. So let me give you something tangible. Something that you can hold on to. Something you can remember. And when you come, don't forget. Now, when you come and take of the bread, remember that by my stripes, you have been healed. You are healed. But he also says, he says this, that when you come, make sure you don't have aught in your heart. Now, I want to say this. A lot of people are sick. A lot of people are miserable. A lot of people are not able to conquer some things physically in their body because of what I just said. They still hold all in their heart. They still hold something against people. They still are, 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 uh, have all this misery in them about certain people. They're still angry. They're still mad. They're still holding on somebody did me wrong song. They're still holding on to it. They won't let it go. They won't get past it. They drag it along. They smile in God's face and drag it along every time that person drags up. I'm telling you, the blood of Jesus can wipe that out and bring healing because those things keep you sick. Now, many a person doesn't believe that. I understand that. But I can take the Bible and point it out to you. And so 
that doesn't mean that everybody's sick has got something in their life going wrong. Let me say that because we're so crazy, you have to watch what you say because somebody takes it and makes something out of it. I am not saying that everybody who's sick has done something wrong in their life. That is a lie. I'm not saying that we live in a fallen world. We live where, where all kind of darkness and all kind of stuff that's in the atmosphere, all kind of stuff is happening, all kind of stuff, and even our, the, uh, the air we breathe is, you know, can make you sick. So I'm not saying that I'm, I am specifying if you have some of this other. Yeah. Get it out of your life. And then just plead the blood over you to help you go on. All of us have been sick. All of us have been in pain. All of us have thought we weren't going to make it. All of us have been just down and out and hurt and think you can't get up and can't make it and sick and all. There's not anybody in here who hasn't been sick. We've all been sick. But God provides a way that if we use it correctly, can begin to boost it. And he even gave us doctors, doctors and nurses and folks and medicines to help propel us and to help move us on. But when you take them, you claim the blood of Jesus and the bread of Jesus over what he has provided through the medical profession. We thank God for the medical profession. Most of us would be dead if they weren't around. Hello? So we're certainly not against them. We praise God for them. If I need them, I'm running. Hallelujah to them. But I'm saying, even there, it's not stronger than the provisions in the Bible. And we combine them, putting the Word of God above the other. And so when you come today, think about where you are with it. Think about what's guiding you. Think about where your heart really is. And then come and dine. Come and dine. Come and dine. It's free. Come and dine. It belongs to you. And then when you come, whatever the devil brings up about that sin, it doesn't mean, you know, you can, you can say something today and then tomorrow you act like a fool again. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Thank God for the blood. It never runs out. And you say, oh, God, I did it again. Oh, forget. But you don't wallow in it. Right. You really believe in the sufficiency of the blood. It does not take wallowing and swimming in the blood. It takes believing in the power of it. And just taking it. Lord, you know, I didn't mean to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I used to do it ten times. I'm now just doing it, you know, three or four times. Or maybe I'm just down to nine, but I'm getting better. Hallelujah. And God is a God of mercy. When he sees you moving toward him, he runs and embraces you and pulls you to him. He will not leave you nor forsake you. So as you come today, come and dine. Come and dine with joy on your face. Those of you at home, dine graciously for God and his forgiveness and mercy and that heaven awaits you a trumpet no matter if you can't half hear. You'll hear that trumpet, I promise you. I mean, if you deaf like a doornail, you're going to hear the da -da -da -da. You're going to hear the trumpet, I promise you. And we're going up in a second like this and awaited to the greatest supper ever known to mankind. This generation will not die and we will enter God's kingdom hallelujah and be changed to live with him forever hallelujah church it's shouting time praise his name won't you come as the ushers lead you thank you Jesus take the individual cups or the common cup or any way. Just come both sides of the table, please. Just keep coming.
Brother Ray really knows how to play, doesn't he? Absolutely beautiful. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm going to say it again just because people like to take things and make something that I never said out of it. You can't always explain sicknesses and things that happen to people. You certainly can't. All sickness, I don't care what it is, is sin. It goes back to the root cause. Not that you sinned, but sin in the world. And so don't you get all down and out, think something that happened to you or somebody thinks that something's in your life because you're having struggles. Uh, as I said earlier, I hate when people do that to people. We all walk different places, and God graces us in different ways to do different things. All I know is that God loves you. He's not mad with you. And one day, for those who are having such great struggles, you'll be free. And you're going to be astounded at what you're going to receive in heaven and what God has for you. But it has nothing to do, nobody's judging anybody. We just want to love you. And when I have difficulties and struggles, it means the world to me that you would pray for me and care about me. And I'm sure it means the same to y'all. You know, God has put the church in a bubble of protection uh, of, against some things that's been happening in the world, and I think he will keep doing that. That doesn't mean that the devil doesn't try to do everything he can to take us all out. And we have to stand firm for each other. But don't let the devil ever put condemnation on you about anything you're dealing with if it's a bad headache. I don't care what it is. Don't let the devil do that to you because God and God's people would not do that to you. God is a loving God to his people, and he pulls you to his bosom, and we desperately need each other. So love on folks and care about them and pray for them. Won't you stand? the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb, church. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Strange days we're living in. Strange days. Thank you for being here. You know, it's difficult sometimes to, to give, to teach prophetically and to try to help you understand where we are and what's happening. But you have to walk in your calling. And uh, I know God's going to grace us for every single bit of every walk that we have. I do know this, and I know it from, I've been saying it for years. But I tell you, I might have been saying it sort of like going to Atlanta and walking. Well, I'm going to Atlanta, going to Atlanta, going to Atlanta. Might have taken me years to get to Thompson. It's not <laughs> going to Atlanta, going to Atlanta, going to Atlanta. But I'm a little closer. I made it to Greensville. I'm on my way up there. Hallelujah. And now I found myself on the outskirts. Matter of fact, I can actually see and taste, you know, the, 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 where it begins to talk about. It's right in front of me. It's right in front of me. And that's exactly. But it had not I kept that in my memory, had I not kept saying, I'm going to Atlanta, I might have taken a side trip. So as I tell you, Jesus is coming. Don't take a side trip because he's about to show up, I promise you. We're going to see him. That's what he said. We're going to see him. Praise his holy name. I love you. Hope you can be with us tomorrow night. Keep a watch. Keep your eye on Israel. You must do that. Miss Mandy, will you close this, please? I love you. Father, thank you for this word this morning. Father, the truth, the truth of your word, Lord. 
Father, let us apply it to our hearts. And Father, let us make a determination this day to walk in this word. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us, Lord. We honor you and we praise you. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name, amen.